Now, coming back to Kathmandu, in this scheme of things, who were the actors and what are the kind of actions that went on? I'll just present some snippets, a little bit of dramatized here. In 1970s, early 1970s, government of Nepal uh, sought and took loan from the World Bank for improving drinking water and sanit sanitation, a sewerage system in Kathmandu Valley. As expected, there was no quality improvement. Uh, the level of service continued to be poor. And of course, people started to say, you know, we've been investing so much, but we don't get water supply in our taps, sewerage system don't work, et cetera, et cetera. And then the press begins to write. We had no democracy then. So there was a muted kind of a voice. But still, the pressure was sort of tremendous at that point in time. And then the government in 1986 formed an independent commission, perhaps first time in its history, a parliamentary commission. We had no parliament. It was Rashtriya Panchayat then. And my colleague, Deepak ji, he, he just had been back from Berkeley after his education. He was inducted into that commission. And uh, one was a uh, additional secretary in the government and a member of the parliament who recently died, Mr. Bidendu Kesari Pokhreya. And that commission made recommendation of fundamental nature, talked about decentralization, bringing in municipality, changing the structure of the board, of the utility that managed Kathmandu's water, forming tariff commission, and, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, the report was filtered out by both the bank and government of Nepal for almost 10 years. And clearly, during that period, resources, foreign aid money continued to flow in millions of dollars, and of course, international and local cons con consultants continue to partake on the pie. Between 1990 and 1995, UNDP alone, I think, invested close to about $10 million in studying Kathmandu's water supply system. So lots of stories there. And in the meantime, uh, the service continued to become poor. The river quality continues to go down. And come 1990, and we have democracy, and then of course it opens the political space for articulating voice and thoughts and ideas and actions. And what starts is what's called Save Bagmati Campaign. You know, save the Bagmati because it's going down. I was one of the members of the campaign. But it did sustain its campaign for a while, for about two to one half years, but then loses steam uh, due to a variety of reasons. Mid-90s, about 97, I think, 50 individuals in Kathmandu, you know, writers, journalists, professionals, got together and uh, signed a s statement and released it publicly saying, our ashes when we die, let that ashes not be offered to the river, to Bagmati. You know, it was a sort of a s expressing a sense of indignation and then forcing the society to sort of react by saying, who the hell is who the hell are these guys, to make a, such a statement. And it did create a little bit of an impact, because that was the intention of you know, signing that statement. But still, yeah. And then, subsequently, the government forms a high-powered commission uh, to improve the quality of water. You know, the Bagmati flows on the eastern bank of Pashupati Nath, the holiest temple. And then, of course, we have lots of pilgrimages coming from all over India, all over the places, and then the quality of river is poor, so it's make a bad impression. So this particular commission was constituted, and then it does. The government then allocated money, and a plant was built upstream of the temple to trap the uh, sewer that's come into the river, treat it, and then dump the treated water into the, into the river. Unfortunately, the design, it was government of Nepal's own money, by the way, uh, no foreign aid here. So if there is pressure in the created government does function and behaves in a particular way. But it has ceased to function now. So what's done in that sewage is trapped, a tunnel has been dug, and then the untreated sewage is dumped in the river by passing that section you know, along uh, Bagmati River. So it still looks clean. But in the meantime, Bagmati River continues to become, I said, mati. Now you can use whatever pejorative that you want. Uh, you know, I don't want to use that word, but we call it, you know, this mati. 
Now you would you would sort of ask me, you know, why why this bit of a dramatization? And it's something I'm sure uh, Deepak will will talk about. This basically talk about four different worldviews. You know how the government responds and how the society, you know, sort of raises a critical voice and how more the market individualist sort of behave and how does the general public, you know, the um, admi, you know, how do they sort of uh, react and how do they continue to cope with the degrading state of rivers. So some immediate issues. So what is what can be done? Is, is there a possibility of bringing sanity back to the rivers? Can we make Bagmati a living river? Clearly studies and ex done by uh, all these different people over the years uh, sort of, you know, highlight a couple of points. Perhaps we need to begin to think about quality of drinking water service, improve the quality first. Think about improving the treatment functions of the treatment plants, the sewage treatment plants. The World Bank loan did build a couple of sewage treatment plant and they never functioned. You know, deep institutional dysfunctions and I'm sure Deepak will touch upon this. <coughs> Think about how what you deal with solid waste. Don't dump them in rivers. The rivers again, like the rest of South Asia are sources where areas where squatters come and live and slums develop. Think about sign mining, river mining. They have been source of revenue for our <coughs> local government and also source of livelihood for you know, some of the squatters. Get institutions right. What institutions function, what are the responsibility and what are the sense of accountability. Focus on regulation and laws and begin to think about sustainable urban development. And for Nepal, perhaps we should begin to reflect a little bit on the historical context when or within which modern technology, water, irrigation and hydropower came to Nepal. Now this is a palace, it's called Fohra Darbar. This palace used to be where the American have their club now. You know, this used to have a fountain uh, with, in, you know, rose water. The first drinking water project in 1881 was built to bring water to this uh, palace. This was uh, a kind of, a, you know, where drama would be set for the prime minister, Mr. Bid Samseer. So modern technology made advent to Nepal as an element of luxury, not as a means of production. So perhaps that historical distinction is something <coughs> we in Nepal need to begin to think about how we think of modern technology and our institutions that manage this technology. And perhaps we need to begin to think about a new future, imagining a new future, not just for Kathmandu, but I think broadly for, for South Asia. And we need to begin to think about improving our public health system. This is broadly related with water, rivers, the west, sanitation, and, and so on. Think of an approach that ends mixing of the three types of fresh west into, the, into fresh water. The yellow, the gray, the black, and the yellow. Begin to think about uncoupling human economic development from this whole fixation with water-based waste disposal system. I think it's been a civilizational folly that human civilization did. You know, trapping water from nature, treating it, bringing it to your home, and then a little bit tip of your finger, turn it into feces, and then without blink of your eye, throw it back to the river. I think that's, that's, that's something we need to begin to think seriously as human civilization. And clearly the infrastructure, the cities are going, is there a way we could think about our urban infrastructure to become a kind of a net contributor to ecosystem services? Is that a future that we can think about? And then clearly as climate change is happening, the infrastructure and the future that we think need to be robust and resilient on the variety of climate conditions. <coughs> and perhaps to, to, to do, do that, we need to begin to be asking some questions. How can we make cities infrastructure generally, and how can we recraft to restore the natural capital and ecosystem services before the city began experiencing degradation? Is that a possibility, or that's kind of a transformational change which is unachievable? Or is, it, can, is there a point from which we can make that beginning? Can we begin to re-engineer our urban landscape and infrastructure to make it a living space where you, know, you do a good living? And then how feasible it is to begin to conceive of a cityscape from such a perspective? Clearly, I have no answers, but then uh, we need to make that beginning somewhere. 
And then let me end by sort of saying, in South Asia, we consider our rivers to be pure. The rivers washes our sins. You know, we have conferences we, where we go, we worship river, we take dip. We go to Banaras, everybody, every Nepali comes to Banaras, has to take a dip. Many, many years ago, we are there with our families. And of course, Deepak son is here. And then we force these guys to take a dip. And then Deepak put a finger, I put a little bit of a water in my face. Of course, our wives uh, took a bath. You know, that was the state of the river. So the question, therefore, is why are the sections of our river? Not all rivers are dirty, as Mr. I was saying, but why some sections of many rivers are polluted, dirty, and degraded? The question is, is there a sort of a notional difference between physical purity and spiritual purity in South Asia? Is that something we need to be thinking about? You know, if rivers are pure, wash sins, they have to be pure. They have to be pollution free. You know, they have to be there in their sort of natural form. Perhaps then we could begin by uh, a new slogan, uh, uh, no human waste in water cycle, uh, a beginning. Because if we're not careful, if we are not careful, we may end up depriving our children, you know, the fun, the learning, and the opportunity to good as a good person. You know, I don't want my grandchild to be sitting on the bank of Bhagmati and say, Jesus Christ, whatever, whatever he swears. Oh, my God. My grandfather had a chance of looking at this river when it was pure, but now it's absolutely filthy. And, you know, I don't want to swear. A good person, a global citizen, perhaps, and a well-grounded individual. Otherwise, they may have to be happy, content with watching computer-generated animations of our rivers and our landscape. And that's bad news. Let me stop at this. Thank you.